Coming up, the power of the half hour. All your local news that matters from both sides of state line to right here in the heart of our city. Your week reviewed next. Week in Review is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, Bob and Marlies Gorley, Smithfield Foods, Haas and Wilkerson Insurance, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome everyone, I'm Nick Haynes and we are thrilled you're with us again on the program that connects the dots for you on the news of the week in this place we call home, pouring through the week's top headlines with pithy insights and analysis and hopefully a dollop of good humour from KCUR News, Mr. Up to Date, Steve Kraske, and from the Call newspaper, senior writer Eric Wesson. From Fox 4 News, reporter Shannon O'Brien is with us, along with Dave Helling, political analyst, columnist and editorial writer at your Kansas City Star. It has been a long time since we talked about the streetcar on this program, nearly a year after voters approved expanding the line down to the plaza and onto UMKC. There's a setback this week. They're not getting the federal cash they need to make that work, at least not this year. The streetcar authority is relying on federal transit money to pay half the costs of the expanded streetcar line. So is this a temporary bureaucratic blip or a cause for concern that may prevent the project from opening as planned, Steve? No reason to panic here. Uh, the insiders weren't expecting this money to come through this year, Nick. The project hasn't gotten all that far yet in terms of the engineering phase of it. That sort of made it ineligible for federal funding this time around. But I think uh, folks are pretty optimistic we'll get it sooner rather than later. Keep in mind, one of our area members of Congress, Sam Graves, is a top official in the House. He's the ranking member of the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee that should help too. Which will we be riding first, the streetcar or going to the brand new a KCI terminal, Shannon. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's anyone's guess. If somebody knows that, they should make a bet on it. They make a lot of money. Um, but I think there is a problem with the streetcar in that I don't think the message has been um, told correctly to, to, the, to the public. And so we have the streetcar now. That's not going to be happening as soon as people thought maybe it would. Um, we've got some issues with the airport. And then, of course, you know, with affordable housing, they don't have the money, but they have the plan. So I think Kansas City is facing a credibility issue if they don't start communicating better to the voters and the public about kind of what's going on in these projects. We just came out of a mayoral primary, 11 candidates. And with the exception, perhaps, of Clay Chastain, no one seem to be expressing concerns, though, about expanding that streetcar down to UMKC. How much concern is there at this point in time with regards to that project, Eric? It's not really that popular unless you lived in that area and you voted for it, if you're along the, the route that the uh, streetcar would be taking. But I think that the issue is going to be later on down the line. I think right now is the beginning phase of it. Once they acquire what they need to and the money, I think it'll catch on a lot better than it is now. Right now, now it's kind of pretty much on the back burner. Now, originally, the plans were to have the, the new expansion project open by 2023. Now they're talking about 2024. The airport, though, would be built in 2023. Yes, although just yesterday, the New Orleans airport, which looks suspiciously like the Kansas City new terminal may look, announced a, a delay in their completion until the fall of this year. So that schedule will slip for the airport as well. A couple things to keep in mind about the streetcar, Nick. First, it's very expensive. It's $100 million per mile. That's a lot of money. Getting all of that money into one place is going to be difficult. And second, while the streetcar isn't an issue in the mayor's race, transportation is. The bus, walking, sidewalks. Uh, Jolie Justice has talked a lot about trying to create um, modules or nodules in the city where people can go walk to bus stops, that type of thing. So I think there will be a conversation about getting people from point A to point B as part of the broader discussion on jobs, affordable housing, the economy, and that type of thing. Now, lots of education stories are grabbing the headlines this week on both sides of state line. And it's not just these seven teachers from that same Kansas elementary school who are all pregnant at the same time and got a surprise appearance on Ellen this week. We gathered all of the teachers in one room since pregnancy is obviously contagious there, so <laughs> let's see them. Hey. 
Yes, believe it or not, there were bigger stories in Kansas, including the Kansas governor signing into law what was the most contentious issue of the session, school funding, $90 million more going to Kansas schools, and all in the nick of time. This upcoming Monday is tax day, but it is also the deadline for lawmakers to brief the Kansas Supreme Court about what they have done to address their ruling that they weren't spending enough on schools. But does $90 million bucks equal judicial happiness, Steve? Well, we're going to have to see what the court says, Nick. And this is an interesting moment for the Kansas Supreme Court. You know, after lawmakers uh, spent so much money last year to fund the schools, now you're looking at $90 million a year for four years, a total of $360 million. You still have school advocates saying that falls short because even that formula doesn't take into account the inflation factor on the out years, years two, three, and four. Year four, they're saying, should be $360 million by itself, not $90 million. But if the state Supreme Court comes back again, Nick, and says you need tens of millions of dollars more in this formula, you begin to wonder what the public's reaction is going to be to that, how lawmakers are going to react to. There's already a lot of frustration with, with the Supreme Court now in terms of ordering this but, spending. But we already, we already have Republicans controlling the House and the Senate in Kansas, and they, they, um, we still had $90 million more going to school. So right. they may object to it, but clearly they have not been unwilling to spend money on schools. Well, one of the key Republican lawmakers, Jim Denning, was actually at the signing ceremony with uh, Governor Laura Kelly, there is bipartisan, rough bipartisan support uh, for this proposal, Nick. And, and frankly, the Supreme Court can see, read the tea leaves. If uh, its members decide this still isn't enough, it, it could really provoke the legislature to go out on a limb about constitutional amendments and other things. Having said that, if you use 2010 as the baseline, which the court does, and you look at the base state aid per pupil in Kansas, and then Add inflation until 2019, this bill is still several hundred dollars short of where it was then. And that's what the plaintiffs are saying, mm -hmm. that you haven't caught up with inflation compared to the 2010 budget, which the court said was a good baseline. So okay. Th this there legal, is still a chance the court This has been going on for about 10 years, Shannon. So we're going to still be continuing to talk about this on this program, it seems, for years to come. Oh, I think absolutely. And you know, this $90 million, this new money that the governor has signed, um, into law, that is just, it's, that's not the funding bill. That's just for, to account for inflation that was not accounted for before. Mm -hmm. So it's not, that's not the budget, but that's just extra money on top of the budget that we haven't been paying before. So I think that's important for people to remember, and we're still not there yet. On the Missouri side of state line, two charter schools abruptly closed, leaving angry parents looking for alternatives. One of the schools, by the way, the Kansas City Neighborhood Academy, had only been open three years. And the Kansas City School District shuts the doors on efforts to hand over Southwest High School to a community group wanting to reopen the historic school. Eric, help us understand why did the school district think it was better to keep the school closed than have a community group run it? Uh, just the image, and I, and I don't believe that everybody... Why is that a good image? Just because they were concerned about the group that was going to open the school. And the people in that area are very concerned about, and they have a lot of influence on who's going to take over that school in that neighborhood. Uh, and I don't know if the, the people that were going to open that school passed the smell test, but uh, I know there were some concerns about them. With the previous board, uh, now the new board that's coming in, they might be able to uh, convinced them to do something different, but the previous board had an issue with some of the people. KCNA closing was attendance and money. I think they had an $800,000 gap, and, and when the enrollment went down, then that means the money goes down because the money follows the students. And well, What was, amazed me about that story, the Neighborhood Academy was came out of the Chamber of Commerce and the exactly. Neighborhood Initiative. You'd think they would have had much more of a support system around it uh, for that to, to remain open, that they would have the secret to success in an urban education? They had the, the support, they just didn't have the students. And with so many charter schools and so many choices to choose from, parents were choosing something that was more appropriate for their kids. And that's what caused their, caused their attendance to go down. But the superintendent, Mark Bedell's decision making is getting an endorsement because this week he gets a three year extension, a $40,000 raise. So he must be doing something right, Dave. Right, 40000 more than his original starting salary of $225,000. Here's the important thing, Nick. It's a fully guaranteed contract. If the new school board fires him tomorrow, he gets paid a lump sum equal to what he would have made had he stayed to the end of the contract in 2022. That's 
$800,000 or more if you figure in benefits. There was some opposition to it. The vote was five to three from the outgoing board, which, by the way, made the decision just moments before they left office and the new board took uh, their oaths. It's uh, it, it's a pretty interesting and uh, compelling story about how this went down. It is interesting and compelling. Having said that, about the new superintendent, still relatively new superintendent, he has this district on a roll. Nick, there's some momentum here. Great hopes that this district will finally regain accreditation next year after so many years uh, without it. And that's a, an important inflection moment in the city. If he can pull that out, I'm not sure there are many people in this community who wouldn't argue that he's. Worth all that just say, okay, let me get Eric's yeah. perspective on that. Yeah, and he's done a good job. He's got good connections with the community, with some people in the community, most of the people in the community he has good relationships with. The kids are doing better. They're off the front pages of newspapers and the bylines for the front of all news stories. So he's done a tremendous job. And I think most of all is stability. He's been there three yes. years. He's going to do another three years. I know his wife doesn't want to move anywhere else uh, with their kids and take their kids out and put them to, into another district. His kids are there. So I think he has a vested interest in the community now that gives him an edge over whatever they were trying mm -hmm. to do not to vote him. Fifteen man. seconds. Stability is what the board members all said. We want someone around here for five years or mo more. But to Steve's point, if they don't get accreditation, then it isn't clear what the school board can do. They're on the hook for paying him through 2022, whether the bottom falls out of test scores or whether they skyrocket, and some people are concerned with that. Now, higher education making headlines on both sides of state line two. A conservative speaker at UMKC ignites a disturbance that leads to injuries. At Missouri Western University in St. Joseph, a confrontation over a student wearing a Make America Great Again hat attracts national news. So does a story at the University of Kansas, where a congressman slams KU for adding a new course studying angry white males. Now, some people claim people wearing Make America Great Great America ca caps, rather, are unnecessarily provoking people. But doesn't the university who starts a course titled Angry White Male Studies also unnecessarily provoke people, Shannon? Absolutely. I think so. And, you know, if you look at that course, it's really the name that is so divisive, you know. The course itself just is a history of men, you know, back from the 1950s and things. Um, but the name is definitely there, I think, to entice some some people to take it, some divisiveness, and some attention. We don't have lawmakers in Kansas saying we're going to cut off funding to KU as a result of this? Well, Steve? you have a congressman, Ron Estes, down in Wichita, who's none too happy, and I think he would like to see that happen. I think Shannon is, is exactly right here. The title of this course, you're, you're speaking to someone who teaches in higher education, the title of this course is designed to get students to sign up for the course, Nick. I think that's what's uh, the, the stimulating factor here, the controversial factor here. You know, higher education is about free speech, lots of different kinds of courses that students can sample. I'm not sure this is where you want to hang your hat in terms of your career. <laughs> Eric. I, it sounds like an interesting course, if nothing <laughs> else, uh, just out of curiosity to see what they would be talking about. But I don't you. think it, <laughs> yeah, I, I would like yeah. to know what they're talking about. But I, I think it's something that's just, it'll phase away and go on with, to the next subject over there. Well, the big local focus right now is on the mayor's race. Could Kansas City voters also be deciding at the same time in June two competing measures on tax incentives? One would trim back the use of subsidies. A second from Councilwoman Teresa Law would block any effort to rein in incentives, arguing the city needs that tool to complete, compete in the so-called border war with Kansas side cities. We are living next door to one of the wealthiest, if not the wealthiest county in the country in Johnson County, Kansas. So if we implement uh, a policy that disables growth and economic development in Kansas City, it will all go to Johnson County. So will there be two competing measures on the June ballot, Dave? We'll find out. As of now, no. Just question one. We assume question one which would put a cap, a further cap, on property tax incentives for new projects. Um, you know, I think Congre uh, Congresswoman, Councilwoman Lohr, uh, has, certainly has a right to, to make her views known, but there's an easier way, if she doesn't want to cap incentives, to do that by convincing people to vote no on the ballot measure that's on the ballot in June. There's no reason, really, for a competing measure except to make a political point. So uh, my guess is she pulled it back, 
She told us Tuesday we're going to take another look at it. She may abandon this effort going forward. We'll see. In the last uh, primary election for mayor, we had candidates who really did want to look at reining in those tax incentives. They didn't make it uh, through the ballot box. I mean, they did not get to be part of the run-in election. Um, does that say that we're overemphasizing, Shannon, tax incentives as a priority? among voters in this community? Well, I think, you know, some people enjoy the tax incentives, of course, and it, de it has spurred development downtown. I think the problem um, with, with what Teresa Lohr is talking about is that, you know, she was talking about would require Johnson County and Wyandotte County and Miami County and those counties to also say, oh, okay, we'll put a cap on our tax incentives too, so it's a fair playing field. No one's going to do that. You know, two things here, Nick. One, Councilman Lucas, who's a finalist for mayor, was a lead sponsor of an ordinance that uh, put a limit on incentives. So keep that in mind here. The other thing I think this, this brings up again is something that Dave's talked about a lot on this show, this idea of how easy it is to get ballot uh, initiatives on uh, ballots in Kansas City, Missouri. 1,700 signatures, Nick, is all it takes. And once again, we're looking at this possibility of competing proposals, um, other ideas ideas have been on the ballot, uh, they changed the name of the Paseo back again. You know, it's a lot of stuff, and uh, I think the council should look at making it tougher so that all this confusion doesn't Could, rain. But, but briefly, it will get tougher because the next uh, petitions will have to meet the standard based on this year's mayoral election. It's a percentage, 5% of the total votes ca cast for mayor, and we assume there's going to be a much bigger turnout this time than there was four years ago when... But the when primary was pretty thin. thin. No, yeah. but it's the general that <laughs> counts. Yes. Yeah. And so if we get 100,000 votes, it's going to take about 5,000 petition signatures. So it's going to get tougher. But the, the general point remains, it should be harder to put something now, on Now, speaking ballot. of the mayoral candidates, a driving under the influence charge against Quinton Lucas has dropped this week because of insufficient evidence. That from the prosecutor's office in Lawrence, where the incident happened. What difference does that make to the campaign? Did voters really end up caring about that when they made their decisions in the primary? No, Eric? no, because they never made an issue during the primary. Uh, that was pretty friendly if you listen to all the conversations you had. Nobody really attacked anybody. I think Alicia Kennedy came around the end and started calling people on their voting records, but I don't think it made a difference in the, in the primary. I don't think it did at all, no. And, you know, it was... It, it, it got surprisingly little play yeah. in, in the primary. I agree with you. And, you know, but people also like a comeback. You know, people are forgiving. Um, Quentin Lucas has done a lot for the community, so I think it really wasn't a big deal to voters. But, but even on other issues, though, the candidates weren't bashing each other no. in a very public way, were they? No, the voting records. And one of the interesting things about Quentin's uh, so dismissal was uh, the comment that he gave $1,000 to legal aid. And it really looks like, okay, did, were you not guilty or were you able to cut a deal behind the scenes? Because I know people personally that were under the influence, just had their key in the ignition, whether they were driving or not. They didn't have the resources that he had to, to beat the case. Mm -hmm. And I know they, are, they have a ticket for DUI. Stephen yes. mentioned all of these ballot issues <laughs> that could be question. hitting you. And by the way, having recently voted overwhelmingly against a sales tax to fund pre-K programs, is a new sales tax coming to a ballot near you, this time to build affordable housing? City Hall toying with placing on the ballot a one-eighth of a cent sales tax hike to help the city reach its goal of creating 5,000 affordable housing units. Could that be on the ballot in June, too? No, day? no. If it goes on, it'll go on later in the year. Raise about $10 million a year. That's not exactly all that's needed for affordable housing. Okay, Dave, uh, Steve also mentioned then, uh, could you also be voting on the Paseo name change issue? You may remember that the city council recently voted to change the Paseo to Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard, now an opponent's group collecting signatures to bring back the Paseo name, and they claim they have 2,000 signatures, more than the requirement necessary to put the issue on the ballot. Is that going to be decided this year, too? Yes, that's going to be on the ballot in June. They have the signatures. They have a platform and a position for which it was done. And I think nobody does is fighting against the name. It's the manner in which they did it. Uh, you have an ordinance in place. It requires you to do A, B, and C. It kind of looked like a backroom deal where they did 
uh, E, F, and G, and people feel like that they should be a part of it. But others have got the signatures necessary, and the city council itself yeah, hasn't know. adopted that and right. put it on the ballot. Right, they, and they have 60 days, so okay. they could certainly wait after validation of the signatures, and that would delay it from the June ballot, plus there would probably be a legal challenge based on the original ordinance, so it's a little messier maybe than Eric suggests, but uh, the debate, the argument over the renaming continues uh, apace. Now, for all the talk about violent crime in Kansas City and having the fifth highest homicide rate in the country, why does the biggest headline this week involve eliminating police horses? There are only seven members in the Kansas City Mounted Police Division. How would disbanding the unit help lower murders and drive-by shootings, Shannon? Well, you know, your first question is very interesting. Why is that the headline when there's so much other violence? And it's because it involves animals. You know, people love animals. The Mounted Patrol is out at parades and they're doing crowd control. But the question is, is crowd control and marketing more important than curbing violence in Kansas City? And the Mounted Patrol costs $633,000 a year to the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department. And I think Chief Smith and some others think that money could be better spent with putting um, you know, people on the streets to actually fight violent crime on the streets instead of this marketing. So what would $630,000 oh, $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, $
Uh, and I think not only Senator Roberts, but other senators from other states are trying to put that message out as well. So uh, but, his but chances are, continue but to But there shrink. are other uh, positions, like we talked about last week with the immigration czar. That doesn't require Senate confirmation, does it? Yeah, and there may be an opportunity, and there were some quotes this week from President Trump saying, we're going to take care of Chris. But it may not be a battle he wants to fight. We'll see going forward. Eric. And one of the things I heard from one of the, well, actually two of them, uh, Republicans, were they were mad at him about the voter fraud thing, raising all this sand about it. And then, then they uncovered no voter fraud, like two or three cases. And he tried to make it seem like it was a widespread problem. We had all of these people going to the polls voting illegally. And they said it, it kind of gave them egg on their face to think, think that he was a secretary of state and then he can't find any voter fraud. And finally this week, Kansas City's oldest independent movie theater has shut its doors. The historic Tivoli Cinema in Westport showing its last movie on Thursday night after nearly four decades in business. Why, Steve? The owner, Nick, Jerry Harrington, great guy, says he's simply losing too much money. It's, a, it's become a losing proposition to show art and indie films uh, in town, at least at that place. And no one could be sadder about it than me. I love that place and went often. Uh, and it's a real blow to the arts community in town. There is, though, the Rio and the fine arts theaters, Absolutely. of course, in Johnson County. But I, there is a general concern that Netflix is killing off movie theaters. Is this just the beginning of a trend, Shannon? Oh, I think so. I think probably. I mean, you can't sustain a bunch of independent um, theaters anymore. And if you go to the regular theaters, I mean, they've got the big seats and they've got the, it's so comfortable and they bring you drinks and food. And so it's kind of going the way of the dinosaur, I think. Although the films they play are amazing and you can't really Maybe. see them other places, you can get them at home. And I think that most people are choosing to do that. I would ask Eric and Dave, but they probably like, they never go to Westport. They probably <laughs> never go to a movie theater. I either. don't go to movies and I don't play video games. <laughs> All right. Thanks for coming on this show. That is our Week in Review. Our thanks to our news reviewers from the Cole newspaper, Eric West and from your Kansas City star, Dave Helling. Keeping you up to date weekdays at 11 on KCUR-FM, Steve Kraske, and our special thanks to Fox 4 News, Shannon O'Brien. Thanks Thank for being you. with us. Thank you. I'm Nick Haynes from all of us here at KCPT. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.